dear audience, dear students, dear lecturers, dear guests. I would like to welcome you all today to this lunchtime lecture. My name is Thomas Hadel. I am standing in for Professor Enrico Bravi, who initially invited Federica Fagopane to come speak at the university. I'm not sure if Professor Bravi can um, attend today, but I would like to extend a very warm welcome to him especially. Being from Italy, Professor Bravi first became aware of Federica's work in her contributions uh, for La Lettura, a monthly supplement to the Corriere della Sera, one of, as I understand, Italy's oldest newspapers and still most popular. Later, when taking his students to the EDGE conference in Munich, in 2018, Federico was also there as a speaker. It was there after a short exchange, I imagine, that Professor Bravi decided to ask Federica to come and speak at the university. Federica has been involved in a number of projects and publications, but rather than go through her distinguished CV here, I would encourage you, dear audience, to look up uh, her work by yourself. Um, apart from it being inspiring and wonderful work, it is also excellently presented. I was able to join that trip to Munich and from what I saw there and in the short preparation for today's lecture, I think Federica's work can be described as creating beautiful information. This does not mean covering up the data with styling, but rather emphasizing the value and the importance of the subject matter to the viewer. Today's lecture was originally scheduled in March. The circumstances have since changed quite a bit, as we all know. I am very glad that the lunchtime lecture series has been able to be continued in this uh, remote format. Federica's lecture will be, I uh, will take about 40 minutes after which there's a chance for a short Q&A session. Unlike the lecture at the university, um, the questions will not be asked in person here, but rather if you have a question, please post it in the chat. I will then field the question and read them out to Federica after the lecture. Now, I'm very happy and excited to hand over the screen to Federica Fagapane. Thank you so much, Thomas, for your super kind presentation and introduction. And thank you very much, all of you. I'm very, thank you for having me. I'm very glad to, to be here virtually. And so, um, as, as Thomas mentioned, I'm a freelance information designer, an independent information designer. And I usually work on, with the magazines and organizations designing data visualizations. I'm co-author of Planet Earth, that's a children book published for, by National Geographic Kids and co-author of the Atlanta Geopolitica dell'Acqua that is an atlas dealing with water-related com uh, complex topics. And during the past few years, I worked with United Nations, uh, BBC, Science Focus, uh, Scientific American, and with uh, La Lettura uh, that Thomas previously mentioned. And during this, this lecture, I'll show you a set of projects with different characteristics, but uh, with a common ground on focus on the interest connection that a data visualization piece can create with the readers. And you see that the range of complexity that characterizes my project is broad according to the needs, the usage context, and the clients. So a very quick introduction about me. I first started approaching data visualization in 2011 when I attended the density design course at Politecnico di Milano. My master's degree thesis is a visual analysis of organized crime in Northern Italy. Um, I really liked the, loved the possibility that data visualization offers to explore and talk about urgent and relevant topics. And so I was very interested in using this tool to talk about organized crime in Italy, especially in Northern Italy, because it's still somehow a controversial topic. And in this case, I worked on a tool that would have allowed uh, journalists, academics, and experts of the topic uh, to furtherly understand and study the topic. 
And I'm going to talk about this project because even if it's an academic one, it's not a commercial project, there are no clients, but it really allows me to talk about the process that stands behind such a data visualization project. So uh, this space in four is essential in every design and not only design project, understanding the user's needs. And so during my research phase, I contacted some of my potential users to understand what were their needs in this case. And we discovered that they were interested in identifying the names related to the phenomenon, identifying the areas of criminal interest and geolocalize them, and then linking the names and the areas of criminal interest. And as in every data visualization project, there is then the need to look for official and reliable sources. And in this case, I had decided to, uh, to work with the annual reports of Direzione Nazionale Antimafia. Uh, and these reports are easily available, have the same subdivision into chapters over the years. And for me, this was very important because it helped me also in defining the structure of the project. And they also had that geographical subdivision by cities, and it was very helpful because I wanted to focus on the cities, and in particular, on the cities in Northern and Central Italy. So this is uh, the structure that I decided to give to the project. I decided to work on a temporal component of 11 years, analyzing the changes over time, crossing it with a geographical component of nine cities. And to extract the data, I collaborated with the Italian Natural Language Processing Lab. And collaboration is a, an essential uh, keyword in this, in this kind of job, visualizing data, because it's very important to collaborate with experts and with different competencies, mixing with different competencies. So they uh, extracted, automatically extracted for me, some the, the words, the terms I was interested into from the records that I was analyzing. So this is the structure of my project. As I was mentioning, I crossed a temporal component of 11 years with a geographical component of nine cities. And from this crossing, I extracted all the personal names that were uh, in the documents that talk about this particular city, all the terms referring to crimes, and, all, and the proximity in the test between the names and the terms, because this was something that the users were very interested in to exploring. And for these terms, for these words, I had some data. I had the frequency within the document and the relevancy, uh, the relevance within the document. I was interested in exploring both the data, exploring and then visualizing both the data. And these are some screenshots from, from the data that they sent me. And of course, being an automatic extraction, I had to uh, to analyze it and also to correct mistakes because it's human, uh, the human intervention is essential also in, this, in these cases because it's, it's normal that can be mistakes or bugs. And these are some screenshots for the final project. I decided to, uh, to design an interface that, that would have allowed to explore the different data and the different terms. And I create three different sections according to the user's need. So persone uh, that you see on the left is the one talking about the names, the people, the personal names extracted from the documents. Then there is a section that explores uh, the terms referring to are, uh, areas of criminal activities. And then also another section that allows to explore the proximity in the test between names and areas referring, uh, terms referring to crimes. And uh, this phase, is essential. Defining a visual alphabet is essential in all the data visualization projects. So after having studied the data, I define my visual alphabet, my set of rules that would have allowed me to visually translate the data I was working with. And in this case, I had decided to use a very simple set of rules that would have been uh, the same rules throughout all the project. So each element, its shape is a term, a word extracted from the documents. And the color and the shape always represents the type of term, if it's a name, a crime, or a geographical location, or other. The size always represents the frequency within the document, and the height or a distance from the center, so a linear size, a linear dimension, the relevance within the document. I show you some examples. And as I was mentioning, I worked on three different views, 
And for each view, I created a legend that explain how to, explains how to read these different views. And the, the design of a legend is again an essential moment. And in this case, for each viewer, there's a legend that explains the rules that I had defined with some additional informative elements. So this is the legend that explains how to read the view on the personal names. Each name is grouped by city. And as you can see, for each name, the size represents the frequency and the height, the relevance within the document. And plus, I align, connect the names, the cases in which the same name appeared in different cities. It was an interesting aspect to, to explore. This is the one that, exp that explains how to read the proximity in the text view. So as you can see, the rules are always the same one. And this is the legend that explains how to read the crimes view. And here I use this, right, this radar graph in which each radius is a different type of crime. And there is a radio, there is a, a spider graph for each city. So again, here, as you can see, the size of the element represents how many words there are referring to that crime, the frequency, and the distance from the center, again, the relevance, the relevance for each kind of uh, criminal activity. And these are some screenshots from, from, the, from the user, the, the interface that I design. And so, uh, again, this is for different years. So for instance, this is the situation in uh, 20, 2012. And this is, again, a university project, but it's, it really helps me in explain what are the different cases, uh, phases that characterize such a, a data visualization project. Uh, in 2012, I started working at Accurate. Accurate is an information design agency based in Milan and New York. And it was extremely important and also inspiring for me working there. And then in 2015, I decided to start as freelancer because I was very curious to see how my career would have evolved. A collaboration that allows me to explore, further explore my interest for visual representations is the one I have with La Lettura, the cultural supplement of the Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera. And I collaborate with La Lettura designing visualizations for visual data. Visual data is a data visualization column and I work on the analysis of uh, cultural, environmental and social topics. And there are two important aspects about La Lettura I have to mention. The first one is related to the usage context. La Lettura is a weekly cultural supplement published during the weekends. And I often see the photographs shared by La Lettura readers and the average one is a picture of La Lettura next to a cup of coffee or tea or a brioche in a context that suggests as the reading act is part of a lazy and relaxing Sunday morning. So reading La Lettura is a slow process and knowing the process, knowing the, the usage context is really important for my design approach to designing these visualizations. The second aspect is the fact that for this project, I'm asked to visual experiment while providing meaningful contents. And so the intersection of these two requests allows me to work on pieces that have an informative purpose, but are at the same time next to the data hard field in order to visually engage the readers. My usual design process is mainly composed of three phases. Selection of topics, uh, data analysis, and then definition of a specific visual model. And I usually propose the topics to be visualized. And as communication designers and information designers, we are people talking to people. And for this reason, during the research and design process, I find useful starting from a very personal point of view, trying to put myself in the potential reader's shoes and asking myself at first, what would interest me as a reader? And then of course, could this topic also be interesting for someone else apart from myself? And I won't have a sure answer, of course, to this question. But I think that this exercise can be an effective starting point for finding interesting data sets to deal with. For the visualization, I'm going to show you a visualized data about the CO2 emissions for 40 countries, analyzing the changes, the changes over time. And an important phase for me is the inspiration one. I usually spend a lot of time looking for visual inspiration, not only when I have to start a new project, but almost every day. In this case, I had found this image during my looking for inspiration phase, and I was impressed by the feelings it caused on me because I found it very beautiful, but also slightly creepy. And I like the idea of trying to use this combination of feelings. 
After having analyzed the data, I, I designed the main structure of this piece. And again, this phase, designing the visual model is essential. And I've noticed that for me, designing the structure of a visualization is a step that has two kinds of influences. The first one is given by the data themselves, of course. I analyze them, I filter them, trying to, be, trying to understand what could be the most interesting way to give them a shape. And then there is also the inspiration phase as, as influence. All the, all the visual elements I filled my eyes with during the inspiration phase help me in defining new visual structures. In this case, I decided to show for each country the emissions over time. And for each country and each year, I use these petals to represent uh, the tons of CO2 emitted. And after having analyzed the data, having looked for inspiration, and also having worked on the structure, I really spent a lot of time working on the details and the textures, inspired by that image and also for, by the feelings coming from it. I then added a second layer of information, and this is something that I often do for a lectura. I overlay different layers of information to give the users the possibility of reading the topic I'm talking about with different deepnesses of analysis. And in this case, the first layer of information is given by the emissions data. And then the second one is represented by the color that here shows the change in emissions over the previous year. Red indicates increased emissions and blue decreased ones. And then I added a new layer, another layer of information, a data that could be interesting if compared to the main one. Um, and in this case, it, it's the renewable energy consumption as percentage of the total final energy consumption. And I represented this data for 1992 and 2012 as two different size circles. And this is the final piece, the final visualization. There are some information that can quickly be seen, such as the size of certain countries, for instance. And keeping this possibility is very important, of course. But there are also elements that need time to be read uh, in a kind of slow reading connection that is specific and is related to that particular usage context. And when I work on complex visualizations as the one for La Lettura, I used to think about them as the visual equivalent of long articles. Designing visualizations is an act similar to the writing one for me. I'm designing, I'm writing with visual alphabets and also sometimes experimenting with different visual letters. And for this reason, it's extremely important to provide the readers all the tools to read and to use such alphabets. And this is why designing a clear legend is essential and I dedicate a lot of time to the visual explanations of the projects. And after having designed visualizations and legends, it's very important to test them. And my parents are my favorite testers because they can be very critical, but also because they are not data visualization experts. And therefore, they represent the majority of my potential readers. So I'd like now to share with you a few other design-related lessons that I've learned during the years. The act of temporarily detaching from my works while they are still in progress to show them to the external world, I notice is a very useful one. I think that starting from ourselves can be a very good way to start approaching such a project, but at a certain time we have to exit from ourselves. And designing visualizations for a lettura, for instance, is an intense process, intensive process, and sometimes I have to work on them in a relatively short amount of time. So getting lost in this intense workflow and losing sight of the readers is a risk. For this reason, I think that taking a moment for detaching from my works while they are still in progress to show them to other people can be good ways to not to be trapped in myself. I notice that when I come back to my visualizations after I've been sent them to my parents, for instance, I often have new intuitions on how to improve them even before reading their comments. And this concept is connected to another practice that I could sum up as uh, working at a 1000% zoom and at a 50% one at the same time, keeping always in mind the 100% zoom, of course. To give you an example, another visualization of mine is a visual exploration of the epistolary relationship between Marx and Engels. And in this case, I had decided to show for each year 
the number of letters written by Marx to Engels and vice versa. Uh, the letters are represented as color lines. Each line, one line represents one letter. The blue lines are the ones written by Marx to Engels and the red one vice versa. And as first step in my design process here, again, I worked on the overall structure, uh, organizing the element for each year in chronological order. And having in mind the, this overall structure is again essential. And after that phase, I really spent a lot of time on the details, working on the shape of the lines um, to, have been, to have visually appealing tools, because I think that also this kind of detail elements can have an impact on the interest connection that I like to create with the readers. And sometimes when I'm very focused on the details, I find myself working on Illustrator with a 1000% zoom or more. And I know that I'm particularly obsessive, but in general, I think that the care that emerges from such a focus can be understood by the readers more or less consciously and can have a role in their engagement. At the same time, I don't want to get lost in details, losing sight of the overall visualization of the overall project. And for this reason, apart from printing tests in the correct size, of course, I also find particularly useful stepping away from it. And I don't know exactly why, but I also need to detach myself from the device I'm working with. So at a certain moment, I always look at my visualization in progress from my smartphone. And having a new point of view from which to look at them helps me in defining new visual structure and in, in understanding what are the visual elements that I should work on to refine it. And this is the final visualization, the final piece, with some additional layers of information, the legend, and the explanatory text of the project. I also like the idea of combining data visualization with other fields. I really love theater as actress and author. And during the years I've experimented combining data visualization and theater. Uh, I worked on a piece and I brought on a stage the piece and also visual representations that show what's happening in real time. And coming back to La Lettura, here I combine data visualizations with illustrations, for instance, uh, using illustrations as additional communicative elements. And this piece is a visualization that shows the world as it's seen by the eyes of a pilot. Uh, it's inspired by the book Skyfaring, written by Mark Van Onaker, who talks about how the maps used by the pilots are different from the ones we are used to. And this time, La Lectura asked me to design an evocative sky map. And here I combine data related to uh, passengers, uh, to the airports. I mapped all the airports in the world and about the boundaries, because the countries have different boundaries for the pilots. And I illustrated the waypoints. The waypoints are the reference points used by the pilots to define the routes. And some of them are very nice and also funny names. And so I, designed, I decided to draw some of them. And again, this is the final piece. And in 2016, I designed a whole book combining these two elements, infographics and illustrations. It's a children's book published by National Geographic Kids and White Star, uh, whose aim is to depict our planet mixing the tools of data visualization and illustration. I'm designer and co-author of the book that has been created with Chiara Pirodi, psychologist expert in development Europe psychology. And working with her was extremely interesting and useful because I'd never worked for uh, data visualization on data visualizations for children before. And I really needed to understand if my visuals would have been understood by such a young and different public. It was a very uh, great way and great, great project to explore, further explore and further push the boundaries of data visualization and also uh, explore what elements we can work on again to create an interest connection with the readers. I think that designing a children's book also means giving a very important to the joy, the joyful relationship that the children can have with the book. So I worked on the colors, on the shapes, on and on the illustrations, also thinking about that. And in the last months, I've also had a chance to experiment for Google. 
And more than one year ago now, I was contacted by Google Trends, by Alberto Cairo and by Simon Rogers from Google Trends and Google News uh, Initiative to design a data visualization project using Google data as base. And it was great because I could propose any topic. And again, I started from a personal point of view and I asked myself, is there a way in which I use Google that allows me to explore a fascinating world? Because I wanted to design a fascinating project, I, to work on a fascinating con concept. And so I, I thought that I sometimes use Google to look for the meaning of my dreams. And, and I thought that this was something interesting to work on. So I tried to explore a little bit this, this concept and to, to explore Google Trends data. And I discovered that typing on Google Trends uh, in complete sentences, such as what does it mean to dream about, uh, the related queries section offers very interesting results, such as does it mean, what does it mean to dream about flying or dream about snakes? And then I typed the same question in different languages. And I discovered that there are some universal subjects and there are some subjects that are more language specific. So I thought this was another interesting aspect to work on. And after having analyzed the data, I discovered that there were so many interesting, different interesting perspectives and point of view that I decided to work on a project in four chapters to explore these different points of view and perspective. And also in this case, uh, after having studied and analyzing the data and defining the visual models, uh, I spent a lot of time on the look and feel and the details uh, because uh, I wanted to have fuzzy and organic shapes and elements able to dialogue with the, content of the contents of the project. So I really spent a lot of time on the visual details. And the final project is the shape of dream, uh, the shape of dream.com. And I can't code. So to, to design, the, to develop the website, I collaborated with Paolo Porti, he's a super talented uh, developer. And we work together on the website. Chapter one shows the dream subjects by year and language. I really had so much fun exploring, in exploring the data and in looking for the different dream subjects by year and language. And so I wanted to uh, give the readers the same, the same possibility. The number of petals here shows the interest on uh, the, the change on the interest in the subjects over time. So dreaming about, I discovered that dreaming about snakes, for instance, or dreaming about falling teeth or broken teeth are definitely the most recurring ones. And then I created some macro categories of dreams uh, in my chapter two to explore how these macro categories, such as family, for instance, or human body or natural elements, change according to the language and the year. And then I also worked on the trends in the interest for, uh, for the, for, sorry, in the interest for the meaning of the dreams. So for instance, we discovered very interesting peaks in the trend, such for instance, looking for the meaning of what does it mean to dream about tsunami in May, 2011. And then I was also interested in exploring uh, the connections by the different languages. So how, different dreams connect different languages. And again, there, there were some recording connections that they were very interesting. Some, for, as for instance, dreaming about uh, crime that connected Arabic in English in more than one year. So this was a very, another very interesting project, an aspect to work on. And I really loved working on this project because I was interested on the contents, but it again also allowed me to experiment a lot visually, this time uh, for an interactive project for a website. The next, the next project I'm going to, to show you, it's a personal one, and it's definitely one of the most intense, emotionally, inte emotionally intense one I've ever worked on. A few years ago, um, my boyfriend told me about the boy he had met, an asylum seeker, a ride from Somalia. We were talking with him, uh, sharing information about his journey to arrive in Italy. And hearing about this conversation, I started to think about how few we in Italy know about these travelings, because Italian media tends to focus more on the Mediterranean seaboard. 
but there are often thousands of kilometers before that part, and hundreds of days spent traveling. And I immediately started to think about how I would have liked to use my professional competencies to talk about these journeys, sharing personal data about them. Um, months later, I met a volunteer who works in a welcoming center, and I told her about my idea. She, she told me that she loved it, and she added that she had already in mind a group of people who could have participated into the project. And this is how I met MB, SS, MD, AL, SG, and TK. Six asylum seekers arrived in Italy uh, in 2016. And this is how the stories behind the line, a vision narrative of their journeys, started. I've met them in, 2000, in 2016 in Vercelli, my, is my own town, and they were hosted in a welcoming center there. My idea was to communicate their journeys to give a perceivable shape to their experiences. During our meetings, I asked them about their traveling from their homeland to Italy, and with the help of Google Map, reconstructed their routes, point by point. For each point, I asked them how many days they had traveled together, what was the transportation, and how many days they stayed there before moving to the following place. And in addition, I told them that I would have noted down every additional comment, memory, or note that they would have liked to add to their narrative. This data collection process was obviously completely, completely different from the ones that I'm used to. I usually look for sources online, but this time I decided to exit from the digital world in which I am too immersed sometimes, to go out meeting and talking with the people who live the topic every day. Because I believe that data visualization can be a tool not only to communicate to people, but also to give a voice to people who don't have platforms. And this concept is a very important one for me. So after another aspect I was intimidated by uh, was the fact that considering the range of terrible experiences they've been through and the complexity of the topic, I was asking them a very simple information. But this is because I really wanted to provide a clean, rational and simple narrative of these journeys. And this point for me is a very focal one. I think that such, that such a complex topic deserves rationality and also simple clearness to be communicated and especially then understood properly. After our meetings, I started working on the visualizations and I decided to draw for each person a line, a unique line shaped by the, the lived experiences. And this unicity concept was very important to me. I visualized the day's data as an horizontal line to keep the element as simple as possible. The blue line represents the day spent in each city and the light blue one, the day spent traveling. I also represented the transportations as different dotted lines. And the final project is a website, uh, an interactive storytelling piece. And I designed and then de developed the, the website in collaboration with Alex Piacentin. He's a very talented designer and also an amazing developer. In the landing page, you can see the six lines with the initials of the six narrators. Each single story is very precious. And for this reason, I wanted to be sure to give the lines their own space, showing them at black, as black paths and a white background. Clicking on data, it is then possible to see, uh, to see the data um, about the transportations and the, and the number of days spent traveling. And the red dots represents the moment in which the narrators decided to share some more detailed fragments from their stories and clicking on them allows to read them. To give the lines context that is essential, it is then possible to reveal the maps under such lines. This that you can see, the part that you can see in the circle, is the Mediterranean Sea route, the part that many media, many Italian media, most frequently mention about. But you, as you can see, it's just a very small fragment on all, of all the lines. There are so many uh, days spent traveling and so many kilometers before that part. In addition, I also worked on a second visual model, the distances view in which I stretched the path to a vertical lines and I added the, the, the data about the travel kilometers 
work on a very on another very clean and graphical version. This project visually simple and without any pictures to respect the privacy rules of the narrators talks about a very complex topic and it does from a very personal point of view, a very specific window. And I think that it's essential, it's so important to address such a complex and global topic, uh, talking about big numbers and showing the overall pictures again to communicate it very rationally and to allow a broad comprehension of it. But at the same time, I think that also providing such small windows from which to look at the topic can help in having a deeper comprehension of it uh, without losing sight of the humanity that stands behind it. I've received many comments uh, when I shared the project online uh, that again is a personal project, a side project. And many people were interested in the transportations. Uh, Ayel, a 17 years old boy coming from Guinea, cross part of the desert on feet, and many people share that part of his story. And then also the narrator comments moved many readers. A beautiful comment is the one shared by SG, a 26 years old boy coming from Pakistan, who at the end of our meetings told me, my mind is quiet now. I am quiet because I'm safe and that's why I love it. And again, many readers were moved by the beautiful words by Ayel. You have a beautiful life here because you know that you're safe. This project was a personal one without any clients or commissions. And Alex and I worked on it during the evenings and during the weekends, but we did it very gladly because working on such a topic was becoming a necessity considering my role, my, my job, and the responsibility I feel to use it to talk about complex topics, urgent topics. And many things have changed now since, since the last time I've met the narrators. Uh, we are currently living in a very different world, a world that's different from the, the one we, we used to live in a few months before. I live in Northern Italy, so uh, I experienced this change. I started experiencing this change since March. And during, during the first weeks of March, I decided, that not, I decided not to take personal initiatives on visualizing COVID-19 data. As I told, I feel the responsibility to use my job to talk about urgent topics, and this is a urgent topic. But I feel the responsibility to, to talk about it, uh, to talk about complex topics, uh, uh, sharing the, the data and the information given by the experts, working with experts. And so I decided not to take personal initiatives on visualizing COVID-19 data, but to work on experts if they ever contacted me. And I was contacted by different different organizations to to talk about this topic uh, in march i was contacted by sorgo foundation they decided to create this index the community the covid 19 community vulnerability index that shows how different counties of different states in the united states are differently vulnerable to covid 19 and so they asked me to create this website to explore the vulnerability and to show um, to show these different kinds of vulnerabilities by county and by state. And then uh, I was also very glad when the Overseas Development Institute asked me to design a project to show migrants' contrib contribution to the COVID-19 response. I work on the project again with Alex Piacentini and ODI's Marta Foresti and Emmy Leach. And the project shows examples of reforms, new initiatives and campaigns to recognize and better support migrant essential workers and their contribution in response to the COVID-19 emergency. Each red dot is a story and each tree shows a geographical areas and the branches show different sectors such as healthcare or agriculture, for instance, and also different areas such as local, if it's a local story or a national story. And I was glad to use, again, very simple lines, very simple visual elements to talk about migrants, but it's time to talk about their essential contribution. Okay, 
So I'm, it's time to conclude, I'm concluding. And as you have seen, I've talked about projects that differ from each other in terms of complexity, contents, and also visual, visual elements. But uh, from my point of view, they're all characterized by a common focus on the connection that they can create with the people they talk to. And this connection can pass through experimental visual alphabets that allows the readers to explore topics, hopefully engaging them, through a uh, composition of different shapes and illustrations, again, that have the scope of uh, engaging the readers, or through very simple visual elements that have very meaningful stories behind them. Data visualization is a very communicatively really powerful tool, and I'm constantly curious into experimenting and into using it to give my contribution, my contribution to talking about complex topics, uh, communicating to people, or giving a voice to people. Thank you very much. Federica, thank you so much. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you for the insight you gave us into your work. Thank you. Um, before, or perhaps first, I would like to again mention to the audience, if there are questions, please post them in the chat. But before that, I would like to use my role, the advantage of my role, to ask you a question right away. Um, especially in these last two projects, you struck this this wonderful balance between rationality and emotionality. And I was wondering, how do you approach this balance and how do you negotiate it in the process of your project? Yeah, um, for, for the project in which I, I took the, the migrant project, the project about the, the migrant stories, it was really depending also on our dialogues. It was a consequences of our meetings. Uh, I already, before our meetings, I had in mind this idea of the lines of just in a very mi minimal uh, and rational space. But uh, after our conversations that were extremely quiet, extremely calm, even if they were talking about very, uh, very dramatic experiences, their rationality, their calm really inspired me in visually translate such calm. So it was very a consequence of our conversations. And I was a little bit afraid when I published it that people would have, wouldn't have understood these, these relationships between rationality and, and empathy and humanity, but luckily some, some readers, some people who, who saw it and understood it and I was very, very glad about that. And I think that the, also showing the narrator's comments really helped me in that because really I've been adding a human touch to the project. Just from seeing them or just from having this glimpse, I think it's very clear that there's a very um, the, the beautiful balance between the, the information that you that you create and this emotional story that that you you convey at the same time. Thank you. Um, perhaps you mentioned this earlier when you were talking about your your contributions for La Letura. Um, you mentioned information density, and now seeing um, several of your projects, I would like to ask you and I. But the personal question, do you, do you have a preference of working with, with challenging, very information dense projects? Um, of course, I know that it's, it depends on um, the use case or on, on who and in which setting it is to be presented and published. Uh, I like to work on, on dense projects. I, it, it started because the, the visuals, the visualization for a literature allows me to do that. And so I started working on this kind of project because of that. But I really like the idea of overlaying different layers of information. It's something that I really like to do. And also because it allows me to have rich pieces, but without decorative elements. There are the elements, the visual elements that are there are not decorative ones, are information. And so I really like this idea. I also like to, to work on very simple graphics. I, it's something that I'm doing more now, um, many of them are because of the COVID-19 emergency. And so this kind of emergency requires a different kind of approach to visualizing data, related data. So I like both of the possibility, but I really like to work on different layers of information and dense visualizations. Um, there's a question that I'd <laughs> like to read to you. Are there any topics that you would not like to visualize? <laughs> and if so, which ones? 
Um, there are not, no, I mean, there are no topics that I don't want to visualize. I, I don't like to visualize data to serve a purpose that it's not, to serve a non-ethical purpose. I was very lucky because during the years, I've never asked to visualize certain data because to just to show a pattern that maybe doesn't exist or just to prove a point that maybe it's not actually true. It's nothing that actually I'm lucky because I, clients never ask me, but sometimes may, may happen. And, and this is something that I don't want to do. I don't want to use the, the communicative power of data visualization to prove points that are not there. This is something that I don't want to do. There are no topics that I don't want to visualize. I mean, it depends, but no, I, I, no topics that I can think of. Um, perhaps since, since the last project you showed had to do with the, with the current circumstances, uh, the COVID pandemic, in, in your role as a, as a uh, designer, do you feel this sense of journalistic urgency that when something, when the current topic arises, that you, you want to spring into action, that you want to um, create? Yeah, yeah, visualizing COVID-19 related data was very different from the other, from visualizing the other data I usually work on. Um, because I usually have more time or when I don't have time, it's not because there is an emergency, an ongoing emergency, it's because maybe the time was badly scheduled. Um, so this time was very different and it was very important to work on it in time because I, I, live, I live in Italy, as I mentioned, in Northern Italy. And we in Northern Italy, unfortunately, started witnesses in March that from, for such areas, it was already too late. And so I knew that it was very important to provide cl clear data in time for the countries that still have time to, to try to, to prevent some situations. And this was very, it was a very different experience from, from the ones I'm used to. Hmm. There is another question. Exactly, um, yeah. I'll read it out. What was the most exciting project you've ever done so far and why? Um, I think the, the, the stories of the six migrants, it's, it's still the project I'm most fond of. Even if there, were, there wasn't a, a huge client behind, there wasn't a client, but it's still the one that I think the most care about because of the process, because of the interviews, because I met the narrators, everything was completely different. And then the, the recent project on Google, I was super excited because I was super excited to work for Google. I was super excited because of the freedom that they gave me to propose a topic to, I, I had completely freedom also from a visual point of view. We, of course, we had weekly meetings to, to discuss the progress of the, of the project, but they, they really trusted me. And so it was very exciting to work on it. Perhaps I can latch on to this question, especially what you mentioned last, your collaboration. Um, you have to work, you work with, with data professionals, you work with, with um, developers. I would imagine that there's a, um, a process of getting used to this collaboration, to, to acquainting yourselves with, with, other, with those professions' habits and, and uh, mentalities, I guess. Could you just, could you, I think from, from a student's mm -hmm. perspective and from somebody who has just entered yeah. this, this profession is quite interesting to see what, what lies ahead. Yeah, sure. It's very important to be aware of the fact that I have different competencies and a data analyst have different competencies and sometimes we don't speak the same language. And so finding uh, a, a language that is common from both of us can be, can be very important. It's, it's very important. And so finding the right dialogue and also um, showing them maybe different options and introducing to the, what does it mean to visually translate the data maybe they have worked on uh, gradually, it's very important. And this is why meetings, calls, in all being part of a process and not just uh, showing something that has been done in one month without working on them during that month is very important. So having, mm -hmm. having many meetings during the working process is very important. And also with the developers, because I worked with, mostly with two developers. One is Alex Piacentini, he's also a designer actually. So it's super easy because he's also a designer. So 
we we never had any issues. The, the classic issues between the designer and developer, we didn't have it because he's is a very great taste and sensitiveness to, to, to visual representations. And also Paolo Corti, uh, the other developer I work with, he, he worked in a design agency, Akbarat, the same agency I worked on for years. And so he's also very uh, careful uh, mm. about visual representations and visual elements. And so there is a very good dialogue. And I'm lucky because there are also friends of mine. And so we are also very direct. So there is nothing that is not going well from my side or, or their side. It's very, we are very honest and transparent. Yeah, I imagine that's a good, a good culture to work in. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read out a, another question. Do you have any tips to get interesting clients' commercial projects? Do you like to share your work on social media? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one, one advice that I would do is to, to work on personal projects, side projects, covering topics we are passionate about. And they could be the topics that we care about. It can be about urgent topics, it can be about music, it can be about movies. I think that it's important to practice and to experiment uh, with things, topics that we are uh, interested in too. And then we really can find data for anything. So uh, please not be scared for, about, oh, I, I want to deal with this topic, but I, I've never, I never find the data. No, you will find the data because there are data for basically anything. And, and then yes, I, I do share my work on social media. Uh, I, I, I am on BNs and mm, some requests arise from BNs. I, I'm on Twitter and I have to say that for data visualization, Twitter is a very great social media to, to share, a very good platform. I found uh, many, many interesting projects on Twitter and, and then on Instagram also, of course, yes. So I use social media a lot. And then there is another question. Oh, I'm right. reading about nature, yeah. Exactly. Why does nature inspire you so much in your visualizations? How do you gather the impulses? Um, it, it, it inspires me because I'm visually attracted to the shapes of nature because it's something that I like, I personally like. And again, this is something that for me is, is important. Uh, I, it's important, I think, to, to look for inspiration from the words that we like. First of all, if you're interested into data visualization, of course, it's important to study the projects made by other studio or data visualization designer. But then also not just to focus on one area, on one world, but I think that it's great to take inspiration also from other sectors, other areas, because this also helps us, help us in not to be, maybe not risk to copy other people's work. Mm. If we take inspiration from other worlds, I think it's a great way to have something that is unique and it's very specific to what you're interested about. And, and I like nature and I think that organic shapes, I mean, I like organic shapes and so this is why I, I work on visually elements that recall these shapes. And I use Pinterest a lot, for instance, for, for visual inspiration. So my Pinterest board is full of <laughs> leaves or also jellyfish, <laughs> or, yeah, a lot of nature. And seeing other questions. Right. I think it's another student question or two more actually. Yeah. After graduating, did you have difficulties getting straight into your projects? Actually not. No, because I started uh, working at Akrat Studio, the agency I worked with in before graduating. It was an internship, uh, an internship I had to do during my studies at Polytechnico. So I started working there as an intern for two months and then they asked me to stay. And so while I was graduating, I was already working there. And so it wasn't a, an abrupt moment from the one from graduation to, to commercial clients and commercial projects. So in, in this case, I was, it was very good to me to study and working at the same time. Do you, do you consider it to be um, a benefit to have been, have been so quick with your internship to have sort of the seamless, the seamless transition? Yes, definitely. I mean, for me, it was a benefit also because then also for my thesis, I when while I was working on my thesis, I had already a, a background and I also um, a sensitiveness to what a commercial pro commercial project also has to have. And so this really helped me in, in my thesis. And then also then, of course, as freelancer. So yeah, it, it was a benefit, of course. I'd like to read another question. Yeah. 
according to your visual language, do you always use logic, visual signs and symbols? Or do you go for the aesthetic and beauty? So do you think the symbols must be chosen logically? It depends on the project. There are cases in which my symbols are, most, are mostly icons and because there is the need to use icons uh, that can also quickly show what we are talking about. And so in that case, it's important to have in symbols that are chosen logically. Sometimes I don't think it's essential. I mean, for the more uh, experimental pieces, my symbols sometimes doesn't have, don't have a, a logical connection to what they represent. Maybe if, even if they are, a use set of symbols that maybe are a little bit more abstract, but what is important is always to specify what symbol represents what concept or what kind of data. And so, yes, I, I, for me, I don't think it's essential, but it depends always on, on the needs, on the needs and on the readers. Perhaps another question that I, I wanted to pose and um, maybe we'll, we'll round it off with this. <laughs> uh, the, having been a student and now dealing with students, the question of, of the process, of course, and the confidence in the process, but also in the, in, which is very strongly noticeable in your work, the visual language um, is, is a big topic. And we, I try to convey to the students that the confidence in the process should allow one to approach any project. Yeah. Um, I, just a, a fairly direct question. How did you learn the confidence in your process and where did you gain the strength of your visual language? Um, I think in last, last, last years of university really helped me, especially last year when I attended the density design course that is focused on data visualization really helped me and then working, working and experimenting. So uh, I didn't have such a confidence before and, and also right now I know there is a certain style that can emerge from my pieces, but it's not something that I'm constantly looking for. It's something that is, uh, that came out very, uh, is in, in an instinctual way. And it's a result of researching constantly for new inspiration, for new studying, studying a lot for existing on existing projects on how also the techniques change and new techniques and new tools we can use. I think that, just just working working and it doesn't mean just having a job it means working on, on personal pieces uh exploring experimenting i think that this helps a lot and having having a process is important being also being able to not to sell your not only to sell your project but it's important to sell your process to sell your project but also to being able to explain why you took certain choices why you decided to uh, design that specific visual models and because it's important to be able to to explain your choices and, and what stands behind them thank you i think those are those are very inspirational uh words and i'd, I'd like to round it off with this um federica thank you thank you on behalf of thank myself you. of course um of professor bravi but of also of the entire uh staff surrounding the lunchtime lectures Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for uh, attending. There are two more short uh, notes I'd like to give. There will be uh, one more lunchtime lecture in two weeks. Um, guest speaker will be Dimitri Hegemann, who is a German culture manager. And that lecture will be on the 18th of June. Just leaves me to say that I hope Federica, that we can welcome you in St. Pölten at some point. Yeah, that yeah. Is, that's, um, again, very happy that this was possible, but of course, there's this other thing. It would be nice to have you in the house at some point. Yeah, I would love to, yes. Um, and we hope that the Lunchtime Lecture Series can be continued in its regular format in the fall. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. And from my side, goodbye. Have a wonderful goodbye. day.